Here they come. You know, I've actually missed, uh, missed this because it used to be, uh, Dr. Gillette, that I would get to teach all the juniors statistics on Wednesday mornings. And, uh, <laughs> and it was just so much fun. And we finished what it is uh, we needed to do. So I don't get to see them anymore. I only see seniors. So it's nice to see them. I see um, some of you are turning your video on. If you can, if your connectivity will allow it and your situation allows it, if you can turn your video on, that's going to be really helpful for our guest speaker today. So, um, but if not, we certainly understand and know, you know, we know that you understand your connectivity uh, better than we do. So, but it's good to see you guys. Good morning, Hello. everybody. <laughs> so Mrs. Shamit, um, it's 7.32, should I begin? Sure, it looks like we've got just about everybody in. So fantastic, I think we should go ahead and get started. All right, well, um, again, it's fantastic to see you all. And the reason I'm here, I won't be able to um, stop in for all of your internship slash career exploration sessions this semester. My um, other commitments won't allow it, but I definitely wanted to be here this morning. Um, first, uh, because this is your, your first experience with it, but also because of the special guest uh, you have today. We are very lucky today to have Dr. Michael Gillette with us. And I've known Dr. Gillette for well over a decade. I was very lucky to have the opportunity to work with him when I was with the Lynchburg City Schools and he served on city council. It seemed like forever. I think he was mayor a couple of times at least. And um, he's not only a community servant in that way, he's a successful business owner. He's a college professor. He is, um, he, he's a very bright guy. And I say he's probably one of the brightest individuals, not probably, he's one of the brightest individuals I've ever met or worked with. And specifically, um, he can take a team, a task force of 15, even 20 people. And these are all people who are accomplished and have um, a right to feel good about the things they do and want to be heard. And he can organize them and lead them to do meaningful work. And particularly, he's focused on being a friend of education uh, in this region, which is, which is, of course, something that's near to my heart. Uh, Dr. Gillette has a degree, um, two Bs, Brandeis and Brown, I think. So one degree from Brandeis in philosophy, and then his master's and doctorate from Brown University in philosophy. And I think he also studied Greek, if I'm not mistaken. Um, again, very perceptive very insightful, and his time is incredibly valuable. And so the first thing I'd like you to do, students, if you would use an electronic reaction to thank Dr. Gillette for giving us some of his time this morning, for volunteering to be here with us, I would appreciate that very much. Thank you. And, and the second thing I want to encourage you to do, and you're, you're Gov School students, so I know this is something that you're going to um, move out of your comfort zone to do. I want you to interact with Dr. Gillette. So if he asks you a question, if he wants you to put an answer into the chat, if, um, if he says, um, does anyone have a question for me? I want you to be brave, right? I want you to be brave and take advantage of this opportunity, right? Because it is a very special opportunity. And again, Dr. Gillette, thank you so much for giving these students your time this morning. We really appreciate it. Well, thank you. Thank you for that very nice uh, introduction. Um, I guess it's Wednesday morning, so I'm supposed to teach stats, but, uh, but we're not going to do that today. Um, we're going to talk about ethics um, and specifically clinical ethics. And it's great to see you all. And I'm just, I'm scrolling through. It really is nice. So many of you do have video capability. Um, and uh, obviously you are well-versed in Zoom etiquette. So you have all muted yourselves. So we're not getting feedback and we're not, we're not hearing background noise, which is wonderful. But absolutely, um, I want to underscore um, what you just heard about interaction. Um, I am going to talk for just a few minutes about some introductory material. Then I'm going to uh, produce a case or present to you a, a, an example of a situation uh, that is real, that, that is actually based on my consulting experience, and, um, and ask you to argue about it. And the only way to make progress in ethics, which is my specialty, my PhD is, is in philosophy and I wrote my doctoral dissertation in clinical ethics. Um, I'll explain a little bit about what that is in a moment, but the only way to make progress uh, in, an, in an ethical discussion is to argue. 
And of course, by argue, I don't mean anything ugly. It's not, it's not personal attacks. It's not, oh, you must be wrong because you're stupid. It's, it's, you know, it's not an ad hominem sort of thing. An argument, a true argument is merely, I, I say merely, but it's very important, a process by which we move from a series of assumptions through logical steps to a conclusion. Um, and the conclusion follows rationally from the, the beginning assumptions that we make. Um, that's an argument. Two plus two equals four is an argument. If you believe in two and you believe in plus and you got another two, you cannot help but believe in four. And if you tell me that two plus two equals five, you're just wrong. Um, now, we might be speaking in different languages, so we have to get clear on what you mean by five as opposed to what I mean by four. So there's room for sort of figuring out why people might say different things. I'm not arguing that everybody needs to agree on everything, um, but that's what an argument is. And it's a process of logic. So ethics fundamentally is a function of reason. It is not a function of emotion. Um, now emotions are important. Emotions are motivators. Emotions give us access to intuitions that we have. So I'm not saying that emotion doesn't matter, but ethics itself is fundamentally a rational pursuit. So solving ethical problems is more like doing math problems than it is, say, like psychoanalysis. Now, why am I talking to you? I, I, I should tell you just a little bit about what I do and, and why I've been invited to speak to you. Um, my field is clinical ethics, although I do, I, I should say my field is applied ethics. The vast majority of what I do is in, is in clinical ethics. I have contracts with hospital systems, long-term care communities, um, hospice providers, every kind of healthcare um, platform you can imagine. Um, and in fact, my single largest contracts with the Commonwealth of Virginia. So I provide ethics support to the Department of Behavioral Health and Developmental Services. So they do um, uh, mental health work, intellectual disability, substance use disorder, uh, prevention services. Um, but I work with Centra. Um, right here in this region. And um, I've been under contract with them for quite some time, since 1997 actually, initially to help develop and now to uh, support the ongoing um, efforts of their ethics program, their ethics committee. So I wanna talk just for a little bit about sort of what, what an ethics committee is, but that's mechanical. You can, you can learn that on your own. You, can, you guys are smart enough. You can do a little bit of research, figure out what an ethics committee is. What I really wanna spend our time on today is talking about how ethics committees get their work done. So what does it look like to actually do an ethical analysis? And as someone who works in applied ethics, you need to understand that although my PhD is in philosophy and believe me, I spent, I don't know how many hours grappling with, with very theoretical concepts. When we work in applied ethics, what we're actually trying to figure out is how can we make good moral decisions in real time, in the real world, given the constraints of the environment in which these problems arise? So you can sit and wish forever that the world were different, right? So you could worry about, oh, if only we had universal health care, you know, that's the answer. Well, that doesn't help when a patient is right in front of you presenting in a, in a, in a situation where you don't have universal health care. You have to figure out what to do in the real world. This year has been a particular challenge, of course, with the, with the pandemic. For instance, very early on, last March, I was asked to sit on a committee that helped to write a policy on ventilator triage. So what are we gonna do uh, if we run out of ventilators because we were concerned about the pandemic um, and we have to decide how to distribute what we have. Now, just so you understand, we've talked about allocation of scarce resources forever, right? We've always contemplated the possibility that we have one kidney available for transplant, three patients who need it, who should get the next kidney? Which of those three people should be at the top of the list? All right, that's allocation of scarce resources. We have argued about that and talked about that, and developed policies on that for years, decades. However, the pandemic pushed us one step further. What if we, what if we have already distributed all our ventilators? And what if someone is on a ventilator who has a very low likelihood of survival and a new patient shows up and that new patient has a much higher likelihood of survival, but we're already out of ventilators. We've already distributed all of the resource we've got. Does it ever become ethical to extubate a patient, that is to take a patient off of a ventilator in order to liberate the resource 
in order to give it to someone with a higher likelihood of survival. Now that is pushing this argument to the wall, right? We've never decided, well, you know, I don't think you're doing so well, so I'm gonna yank your kidney out to give it to somebody else who might need it better. If you're still using it, you get to keep it. Well, is the same thing true about a ventilator or is it different? Um, you could wish you had more ventilators, but you don't. So what are you actually gonna do when that question arises? Though that, that's how hard nose applied ethics can be, that we really need to be thinking about these things. And it's my job um, to direct a group of people. Um, I don't do it alone. It's not like, oh, I'm an ethicist, so I know what's right. Um, it, it gets back to actually what Dr. Smith talked about before, which is um, we, need, we need a diverse set of opinions around a table and we need to orchestrate a conversation so that we can fill in each other's blind spots and we can um, learn from each other, but then coalesce and, and come to consensus about, and I'll go back to this word, what the most rational, logically justifiable answer is to the problem before us. Now, in order to do this, we're gonna play with it. And I'm already running out of time because um, this is like a three hour lecture and we're gonna do it in, in not very much time at all. But let me share my screen. Um, and get this baby rolling. All right, you should be able to see my screen. Um, Steve, can you give me a thumbs up? Just to, All right, excellent. So I wanna start just by talking about the ethics committee and I'm gonna spend literally just a few minutes on this. Um, I invite you, by the way, I'll go back to my cover slide. I invite you, if I go over something too quickly just cause we're pressed for time and you're interested in it, feel free to, uh, to drop me uh, an email. I'll be happy to, uh, to respond to any questions. Um, that we don't have time to get to today. So there's my email address, mgillette at bsvinc.com. Um, and don't be shy about uh, getting in touch. So let's just begin with a brief description of what the ethics committee is. Um, and any, any hospital, any healthcare provider actually that is uh, accredited is required to have some process in place for managing ethical issues that arise in the care of patients and even organizational ethics. So there is some business ethics in doing, in doing healthcare. There's a business to medicine and ethical issues could come up that are much more organizational or business ethics. So we need to have some process in place for managing those issues. And the standard of care is the ethics committee. As I said, it is a group of, uh, it's a diverse group of individuals. So we get representation from a lot of different disciplines, doctors, nurses, social workers, administrators, chaplains, you know, we, we, we get across the board and also depth. We don't want just department heads because administrators, once you get to a certain level, you start to see the world in a certain way. So we need, we need opinions from sort of the top of the organizational chart all the way to direct care service personnel. We wanna get lots of different points of view. We'd even like to have balance in terms of of age and race and gender and because, not because, let's be clear, not because we're asking anyone to represent a constituency or to defend a particular profession or, or a particular demographic. That's not what happens on the ethics committee. But because we, we know that your perspective on an issue will be informed by the experiences and training that you have. Um, and so we need to hear that perspective. So the only people who can really do ethics well on an ethics committee are people who are able to say something like, um, well, I'm a nurse on the ethics committee and that's valuable because nurses might see the world a certain way because of their, their, their experiences. But I'm gonna take my nurse hat off. I'm not here to defend the nurses. I'm here to allow that perspective to contribute to a conversation. So that's how ethics committees work. And we do basically three things. The first is education. That is the, um, well, all of these are equally important, but I probably spend more than half my time on education. Educating committee members, mostly spending my time educating staff members, and then obviously sometimes reaching out to the broader community. Actually, today would be a good example of doing some education that, that is for uh, people outside of the hospital. So that's job one. Second, we do policy development and review. Uh, this is an old slide and a truncated list, but just a few examples uh, of the kinds of policies we might uh, write. I've done policies on boundaries and dual relationships. I've done policies, uh, well, I just gave you an example, recently wrote that policy on ventilator triage in the midst of a pandemic. 
So the list goes on. It's important to note that the ethics committee doesn't go fishing for problems. We only respond to what we're asked and we only concentrate on ethics and we are advisory only. We don't set policy. We make recommendations that can be incorporated into policy, but appropriate authorities make the final decision because these questions are complex. They have ethics components and legal components and clinical components and financial components. And all of that needs to be taken into account. So my job is to get ethics to the table, but not to squelch the conversation that might go to other areas of expertise. Third function of the ethics committee is case consultation. Um, a case comes up, we need to make a decision. Sometimes it's, it's something we need to do relatively quickly and it's real world in real time um, and, and we need help. Um, either there's disagreement, there could be a conflict that needs to be settled, or there could just be confusion. People just aren't sure what to do. Um, or it could just be a very, very serious decision. And before staff are comfortable sort of signing off on it, they want another set of eyes to look at it, spot check them, make sure that they haven't missed, uh, missed anything. Because I want you to understand, baby ethics is easy. If you call me and say, Mike, I need an ethics consult because... Um, um, you know, my friend is a jerk and I want to know if I can kill him. Um, I'm going to say that's not an ethics consult. Okay. Like in kindergarten, you should have learned you can't murder people and I'm calling the police. All right. So we don't need an ethics committee for baby ethics. We're doing calculus level ethics here. And people need to understand that it doesn't make you a bad person if you are not sure of the answer um, or even get the answer wrong when we're dealing with a very complex problem. If you get a calculus problem wrong, if you get the answer incorrect, you don't say, oh, I'm such an awful person. You turn your pencil around, you go back into the problem, you figure out where you went sort of wrong in your reasoning, you fix it, and then you come up with a more defensible conclusion to the problem. Well, the same is true with ethics. We are dealing with very complex problems and it's easy to miss something or make a, make a mistake. It doesn't make you a bad person, it means that this is complex stuff um, and it takes training and it takes expertise and it takes a multifaceted, diverse set of perspectives to really see all of the uh, factors that are involved. So the one thing you need to avoid, this is just general advice, is thinking, well, I'm a good person. So my intuition is always right when it comes to ethics. I don't need to talk about it. I just know. You did not learn everything you needed to know in kindergarten that were true, you'd be doing a lot of very disgusting things, picking your nose, et cetera, et cetera, that you just don't do when you get to be a high school student um, at the governor's school. So case consultation, again, advisory only. We don't write orders. I do have privileges to put notes in the chart, um, but they are our recommendations and then the appropriate authorities make final decisions. All right, I've already wasted way too much of our time talking about mechanics. So let's get to the fun stuff. And this is where you get to start talking. Um, this is a real case. It's, it's, it's not a brand new one. It's one uh, that I had a number of years back, but let me explain it to you. I'm gonna now talk as if I were, you know, I'm gonna just present the case as I normally would. I don't expect you to understand all of the medical vocabulary. I'll try to explain it as I go. But if I, if I use a word that you're not sure of, it is, should not be embarrassing that you say, hey, wait a minute, I'm, I'm, you know, could you explain that term? Um, so, Mr. L is a 60 year old patient who carries a diagnosis of schizophrenia not otherwise specified. Um, the new DSM-5 drops this NOS uh, subcategorization of schizophrenia, but that's, I know that, but I'm too lazy to rewrite my slides. So he has, he has a long history of schizophrenia with fixed delusions. So he has been in treatment for his psychotic illness. He maintains himself at baseline. So he's able to sort of uh, you know, basically meet his needs. He can, he can feed himself. He can clothe himself. Uh, he's able to manage money well enough that he can get by. I'm not going to say that he's doing beautifully, but his delusions are fixed. No matter what medications we put him on, you know, this delusional structure is still there. It's not preventing him from surviving, but, um, but it's refractory to treatment. It's not, it's not responding to psychotropics. Now, Mr. L has been hospitalized on a number of occasions for treatment of infections, associated with a large mass on his right thigh that is suspected squamous cell carcinoma, form of cancer. Mr. L has no insight into his illness and refuses surgical intervention to remove the mass. He believes that he can treat the growth with topical salves and nicotine. Now, now let me explain because that sounds sort of wild and I think that's part of his delusional structure. 
So 18 months earlier, Mr. L had shown up at the hospital and he had on his thigh this growing mass and it was really sort of ugly. It, 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 at this point, actually, when I saw him, it was at the end of the story here, it looked like he had a brain growing on his, on his thigh. But early on, it was, it was much smaller um, and sort of convoluted. Um, and there was skin breakdown. So once the skin broke down, of course, it was subject to infection. So he came into the hospital um, because of that infection. The doctor put him on IV antibiotics and the infection pretty quickly resolved. And the doctor said, so what do you want to do about this thing? You know, it, it, it really should come off. And he sends him to the surgeon. The surgeon then says, well, do you want us to remove this growth? And he says, no, it's fine. You, you rub a little Aveeno on it, smoke an extra few cigarettes, and it'll, it'll, it'll be great. So somehow he believes that he can just rub it with Aveeno and smoke some cigarettes, and all will be right with the world. So the surgeon says, well, he doesn't want it off. Guy's discharged. Two months later, he comes back to the hospital because the skin has broken down again, and there's a resurgence of infection. Now the growth is much larger. Um, same pattern. Hospitalist says, I'm going to treat you for the infection, refer you to surgery. Surgeon asks, do you want this removed? He says, no, they street the guy. This goes on and on. Every month, every two months, he comes into the hospital with a new infection. The mass is getting bigger, right? Scarier, but the pattern repeats. Now, finally, after a year and a half, so this is 18 months later, he presents in the hospital again, and things look really dangerous. This, this guy could actually die if this cancer spreads. But by now, the growth has really grown. It's invaded underlying tissue. It's invaded the bone. And so now if we're going to do a surgical intervention, it's going to require an above the knee amputation and an AKA, an above the knee amputation. And it's going to be a high one. We're going to have to take the leg off at the hip. We ask him, do you want it done? He says no. But at this point, point staff are thinking this guy's going to die if we don't do something like the, the ante has been upped here um and so they ask for an ethics consult would it be ethical to seek court authorization okay this guy is making decisions based on his psychotic illness should we get the court to authorize surgery over the patient's objection should we amputate this guy's leg even though he doesn't want us to in order to save his life that's when I get involved? That's the question. So I'm going to ask you, should we or should we not amputate Mr. L's leg over his objections? Who wants to unmute and speak first? And if no one speaks, I will pick on the person who looks like they want to speak the least. I, I, I will go first if that's okay. Mm -hmm. So uh, I think that after reading it that I would say I don't think that it is ethical to uh, force him into the surgery. I think that the point that you mentioned at the beginning that he's just barely getting by. If we did force him into the surgery, I don't think he would be able to get by because of his disability. And so I believe that where he is currently, even though it looks like uh, it's very sure for the doctors that he wouldn't be able to make it, I don't think that it's their choice to force it on a patient when they're very adamant that they don't want to do something, uh, a certain thing. All right, Isaiah, you just made two completely separate arguments. So we need to separate them out and figure out which one actually is driving your thinking. You made two different arguments. Argument number one was, uh, we take off his leg, his life is going to stink. So just let him die. So if his life is going to stink, he should just be dead anyway. So Isaiah says, let him go. Second argument is, um, uh, he doesn't want it. And, and who are we to force something on him? Uh, so he has the right to decide whether or not he wants the surgery. We don't have the right to decide that for him. Now, those are two actually distinct lines of argument. One is very consequential. It's, it's based on how good will his life be once he loses his leg. And presumably that opens the possibility that if after the leg is removed, if he can get into rehab and learn how to move around pretty well without the leg, then actually we should do the surgery because we could get a good outcome for him. So your first argument seems a little weak. Why are you just assuming that you know that it's not going to work very well for him? Um, shouldn't you do some research on that um, before you just make a decision that living without a leg is such an awful thing that anyone who ever is going to lose a leg should just be dead, which is effectively your first argument? Or do you want to make the second argument, which is, I don't really care whether his life will go well, better or worse after we take the leg. 
The bottom line is he has a right to decide whether or not to lose the leg. So it's really just an autonomy question for him. And we don't get to force our decisions on him. So are you making both those arguments? One, the other, um, which, which one really is driving you thinking? Well, I think that, as you said, the second argument is the one that has definitely, uh, I guess, more of a reasoning behind it, because there is no proof that something won't happen or that he won't be able to survive after he loses his leg. That was just, I guess, an observation that I thought of during it. But I think that the much stronger argument is the second one, that uh, it would be, I guess, infringing on his rights to do something that we didn't want uh, for him to do. All right, Teddy Lou, you laughed as soon as Isaiah started to talk, which means you get to go next. Prove that Isaiah is wrong. How would you make a counter argument to Isaiah? Uh, I don't necessarily think Isaiah is wrong. Uh, it doesn't but, matter what you actually think. Right. You should be able to argue both sides. Yeah, I was going to mention something about rehab because uh, obviously this patient has some sort of mental disability. Uh, he he can't make, like, I wouldn't say good decisions for himself, but like he is able of making uh, like great decisions. And so I think we should uh, give him the surgery uh, so that he can live and then put him into rehab. Uh, All right, so, so, so Isaiah starts by saying, you know, the patient has the right to direct care. Um, and therefore, if he says he doesn't want the surgery, he, he shouldn't have the surgery. Teddy comes back and says, yeah, he says that, but he's not really, he's not really capable of, of thinking this through. Um, do we, does he really retain the right to make decisions if he is suffering from a psychotic illness? Um, so we need to take Teddy's view, and this is what we're going to start to practice here, and we need to actually turn it into an argument. So how would, say, Teddy, if that's the view he wants to defend, and, and again, you may or may not actually believe it, but you need to understand the structure of an argument. So you need, you, need, you need to be able to see how argument works. How would we actually take an opinion that is just an assertion? So far, all we have is an assertion. We have Isaiah saying, patient gets to make this decision. That's an assertion. We have Teddy saying, not if you're psychotic. That's an assertion. Now, how do we actually move from assertion to argument? So what would the structure look like to try to support Teddy's counter argument to Isaiah. Lily, I saw your, your, the corners of your mouth sort of curled up. That was a quasi smile. So Lily, um, can you help Teddy actually produce, turn this into an argument uh, that Teddy could use to try to counter Isaiah's position? How would you do it? I would say um, if you have a mental illness that makes your decision-making ability foggy or even slightly reduced, then um, and these doctors, trained professionals who have gone through years of training and education, and they think that this is what's right for you, even if it is, you know, your your um, technical decision. I think that you have to go with the reason of the doctors and saying that, like, they have been trained in this kind of thing. They see that this is a problem. We should use their their insight. All right, Lily, you, you've you've you, you've expanded on Teddy's view but you've still only made an assertion, okay? You, you, you've told us what you think, great. I now know what Lily thinks. Um, but you still haven't actually produced an argument. So, so why should we believe you and Teddy and not believe Isaiah? What, so so you, you've, you've done a nice job of explaining a little bit deeper. Um, in fact, uh, who could give an argument against Lily? Lily's position now is, Doctors go through years of training, they know what's right, um, and therefore we should listen to the doctors. Jeffrey, your hand is up. Yeah, so I, I disagree with Teddy and Lily's position. I think that the patient should have full autonomy over their own treatment, even if they do have a medical condition. And I think it's a slippery slope to allow a doctor to declare somebody, say, mentally incapacitated and therefore force them to have a surgery because it opens up a slippery slope um, anybody could be declared incapacitated for any sort of ends uh, to achieve a certain goal or policy position. So I think it's dangerous to allow somebody else to dictate what happens to somebody's body and therefore uh, they should not impose any surgeries on anybody. Really? Yes. Really? Yes. You're sure about that? Yes. 
Okay, so, so under no circumstances should anyone other than the patient ever be able to make decisions about their health care. Because, because no one else ever has the right to determine that they have diminished capacity. That's Jeffrey, that's your position? Yes, I think that it is too dangerous to allow another person to force judgments upon your mental state. All right, Ina, you're, you look like you're going to burst if you don't get in on this one. Yeah, my name is Ina. But... I'm sorry, Ina. Um, I have firsthand experience with someone in this situation. And so I've seen what has played out and I personally, well, not personally. Okay. So I think that the doctor should have right over the patient in this situation specifically because um, their reasoning for not having the surgery is dictated by um, delusions. And so I don't think that they're um, in the right mindset to be making. This All right, thing. Ina, we, we're going to run out of time if we don't get here. So Ina, I need you now. No, 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 don't, don't be embarrassed. You're doing exactly the right thing. Ina, I need you now. Okay. You're going to be the first one today to do it. So you're going to get the gold star. You're going to be, you're going to be the winner here. Oh no. You need to prove to Jeffrey he's wrong. Now, now you can do this. How can you do this? Uh, because so far, all of you, Isaiah, Teddy, Lily, Jeffrey, now Ina, all you've done is state your view. None of you have yet produced any sort of process that would convince anybody else. You guys are just stating contradictory positions. We have no, re we have no way yet to know which of these contradictory positions actually makes the most sense. Ina, you can do this. What would you say to Jeffrey to, so that he will agree with you, that he will adjust his position? He will say, okay, I, over, I overstated my case. I was wrong. Uh, that's a lot. Um, oh, it's easy. It's easy. Do well, it. Someone in the comments is saying it's life or death, so I'm going to voice Jacob. <laughs> no, we can't go with life or death. Let me, let, let, let me, who, who wrote life or death? Jacob. Jacob? Where's Jacob? I don't see Jacob. I'm right yeah, here. get him on the stage. All right, Jacob, here's the problem. You want to say, well, it's life or death, what? So if I'm a Jehovah's Witness and I get in a car accident and I'm bleeding out and I'm going to die if I don't get a transfusion and the doctor comes to me and says, um, Mike, you're going to die if you don't get a blood transfusion. And I say, listen, I'm a Jehovah's Witness. I have been a Jehovah's Witness my entire life. Um, you know, I'm, I'm an adult. Uh, I, I have thought carefully, long and hard about my religious convictions. And in my view, it is worth risking death in order to avoid the spiritual consequences of, 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 of having a blood transfusion. So I am unwilling to accept the blood, even if it might mean I should die. Jeffrey would say, right, Jeffrey? Jeffrey would definitely say that Jehovah's Witness should not be forced to accept blood. Right? Jeffrey's nodding his head. Jacob? I are agree with force, that. Are you going to force blood on me in that scenario? No, because I believe that it's a different situation. You have to take it differently based on the mental capacity and whatever they're saying, like the reasoning behind their statement. If his reasoning <laughs> is just because, if his reasoning behind not getting the surgery is just because he thinks it's fine, that's obviously false. Like so, he, now, he's so going to die. So Jacob, you're going to do what Ina obviously failed to do. Okay. So sorry, Ina. So, so Jacob, you're going to be the one who argues against Jeffrey because effectively Jeffrey just won half the argument against you. You came out of the box saying that when it comes to life and death issues, then the doctor decide gets to decide to save a life. How, uh, how did I beat you in that argument? I gave you an example where life and death is in play, and you still wouldn't follow what the doctor said. I gave you the Jehovah's Witness case, and you yourself, I knew you would agree that we should not force a blood transfusion on a Jehovah's Witness, even if the patient might die, which proves beyond the shadow of a doubt that it can't just be that someone's going to die that determines whether or not we force treatment. Death isn't enough. You said death is what settles the issue. I gave you an example where death did not settle the issue, which means you were wrong when you said death settles the issue, right? And you immediately recognized that. You said, oh, 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 it's not just death, it's death plus. 
Right. And, and right. And it's death plus. I don't understand. I'm going to die. Now, Jacob, you do to Jeffrey exactly what I just did to you. Jeffrey says patients always get to right, have the right to make decisions about their own bodies. That's his position. Jacob, you do to Jeffrey what I just did to you. All right. I'm going to do it exactly like you did to me. Good. All right. So you say patients always get to make the decision with the patient can't articulate and they don't have anyone to make the decisions for him. Then the doctor would obviously be in a position to make the decision for him. Whatever he thinks is best. Beautiful first move, Jacob. At, good. I'm going to help Jeffrey just a little bit because I want you to sharpen this even more. Jeffrey would then say, Jeffrey, I'm going to put words in your mouth, but don't worry, you'll get a chance in a moment. So, so Jeffrey might respond by saying, well, come on, unconscious patients are different because of con unconscious patients aren't objecting to the surgery. So it's not like someone is sitting there saying, I don't want my leg removed. So, so I'm not overpowering anybody's objections. The case we have right here is where a patient actually currently says, I do not want to lose my leg and we are going to overrule their stated objections. So talking about someone who's, who's unconscious, come on, that, that's not even a good analogy. So Jacob, strengthen it, make it better. You can do it. I feel like if death wasn't enough and then you said that death plus isn't logical because it should be the same is to be a blanket policy. Did not say that. Did not say that. I want That's you, right. I want you to play the game against Jeffrey the way I just played it against you. Jeffrey says we should never overrule the, let's say, conscious verbalized demands of a patient. You said we should never let a patient die. I beat you in the argument by getting you to admit that there's at least one case where we should let someone die. In other words, the most dangerous statements you can make ever are those that are always or never, right? Because all I need is one counter argument. If, if you say we should always save people's lives, all I have to do is find one case where we would choose not to save someone's life in order to prove that the always save people's lives is wrong. Now we could be usually, could be most of the time, but it won't be always. And you immediately saw that and you yielded the argument. Jeffrey has made a statement of universal instantiation. He has said that if a patient is capable of expressing a desire, we should never overrule it. You need to give us one example where even Jeffrey would agree we should overrule a patient's decisions in order to prove he's wrong. Can you come up with one? All right. Hey, so real quick, is it okay if I hop in here real quick? Oh, I, yeah, I just please. Nathan, Nathan, go ahead. Yeah. Hi there. Yeah. So uh, I would just, and I'm not looking to maybe get in on the argument here. I'm just looking to, like you said, uh, give a situation that Jeffrey would almost have to agree here. Um, what if it was a child, you know, and we've got an adult and the child says, no, I don't want this. The adult, the, the, the guardian uh, has that say so in saying, son, I want you to have this surgery. This is, you know, so anyway, there's a situation. Nathan, you, you, you are in the argument, whether you say, I, I don't want to get into the argument or not, you're now in it. So now it's the Nathan versus Jeffrey show. So Jeffrey says, if the patient says he doesn't want something or she doesn't want something, then doctors should never overrule it. Nathan now comes in and says, wait a minute, suppose your kid your minor, your six-year-old uh, has a hot appendix and, and you go to the hospital and it's clear that the child um, is at very serious risk, potentially of death, if you were to let this, uh, this appendix rupture and the doctor says, we need to take out the appendix. And the kid says, I, I, I don't want surgery. Um, according to Jeffrey, we should ask the child and if the child says no, then we should let the child's appendix burst. That's Nathan's example. Jeffrey, how do you respond? Do you mind if I interject? Uh, Alora, go ahead. 
So I believe we're talking about three different situations here. You're talking about a man who has a mental disorder. You are talking about someone's religion and you are talking about a child. Um, I guess to the latest argument, a child does not always make the best decisions. I mean, um, that's part of why they still have parents. You don't put a six year old out into the real world to make his own decisions. Why not? Um, because they haven't had experience. A child may not understand exactly that. Oh, 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 oh. Wait, sign say that again. A child may not understand exactly what would happen if he didn't have surgery. Okay, so wait a minute. So the principle that you're suggesting now is if that an individual does not have the ability to understand the consequences of the choice they're making, if they don't understand the alternatives, risks, and benefits, if, if they're unable to make a rational evaluation of what's likely to happen to them, for instance, the child who, who doesn't understand, I might die if my appendix bursts, that because they don't have the ability to understand what could happen, they can't make a, a rational choice, that that is a reason why someone needs to step in and make a decision for them. That's your position. So if you have, here's, here's now Laura's position. Patients have a right to make their own decisions unless they have diminished capacity to understand the risks and benefits associated with their choice. And a child, thank you to Nathan, is the perfect example of someone who does not have the ability to understand the alternatives, risks, and benefits associated with the choice. Laura, that's your position, correct? Yes, sir. Excellent. Can it not also be the case that someone suffering from a psychotic illness that is refractory to treatment such that they are making decisions secondary to their mental illness. So this is not someone who happens to have schizophrenia, but it's, it's in control and this person understands exactly. And they say, I might have schizophrenia, but I'm also a Jehovah's Witness, okay? No, this is someone who secondary to their delusions believes that if they rub a little Aveeno on it and smoke a cigarette, everything will be fine, which means they do not understand that they are suffering from potentially terminal cancer, which in the relevant sense makes them very much like that child, someone who is unable to understand the alternatives, risks, and benefits. So if you, this is Nathan's argument, if you're gonna tell me that you're gonna allow us to overrule the wishes of children because they have diminished capacity, why would you not also want to overrule the wishes of adults who for whatever the reason, also have diminished capacity. Well, Jacob started with they're unconscious. That's actually, Jacob, a pretty good example, right? I mean, if you're unconscious, you can't make decisions. So I don't care how old you are, we're gonna get someone else to do it. You're making decisions secondary to a mental illness. In other words, it's your delusional structure that's driving your thinking, not your authentic values. You have profound intellectual disabilities. So you don't even understand what surgery is. Um, you're under extreme emotional distress. You are, you're suffering from, um, from such a high fever that you, you can't even, you, you're just flailing in bed. And when a doctor tries to ask you a question, you can't even understand the information that's being imparted to you. Wouldn't those be conditions under which we would get substituted consent, Jeffrey? I will partially concede the point to Nation. Um, he is he's right. A child should not make uh, the decision by themselves. But I think that uh, the the state of being a child is a different kind of impaired state than having a mental disability or having a disease. Because okay, fine, the, the, fine. having a young age is a fact of life. So this is being psychotic. Is Psychotic's also a fact of life. But fine, Jeffrey, I'll give it to you. Great. Child's a bad example. Let's try another one. I um, am standing on a bridge, I'm about to jump off. It is a long drop, I will surely die. You find me on the street, about to, I'm climbing over the railing, I'm about to jump. And you ask Mike, why are you jumping? And I say, because the Martians have commanded me to jump. Should you get an emergency commitment order and stop me from jumping? Should you get a temporary detention order and get me into mental health treatment? Or should you say, hey, Mike thinks the Martians want him to die. I guess that's his right. Are you gonna stop me? Are you gonna call the police? and try to have them stop me from jumping off the bridge and killing myself? Yes or no? Yes, certainly. Um, Nathan's 
says yes. I want to know about Jeffrey. Yes, because the, the decision of somebody to deny treatment is not necessarily such that I want to die. They, their, their aim is not to die. No, Jeffrey, I believe the Martians told me that halfway down, I'm going to sprout wings and fly away. That's how I'm going to get to Mars. That's my delusional structure. I don't want to die. I want to sprout wings. And, and, and God told me, and the Martians told me, that if I jump off this bridge halfway down before I hit the rocks, I will sprout wings and I will fly. And it's going to be glorious. I believe I have a statement here that may sum up everything. Does the condition affect the decision and does the decision affect their life? Of course. Yeah. Yes, Nathan, that's, that's precisely right. And Jeffrey is going to have to admit that if I believe I will sprout wings, Jeffrey, just tell me, if I believe I'm going to sprout wings halfway down before I hit the jagged rocks, is would you then say, let him jump? No, I wouldn't. You would not. Of course you would not. Right? Because you actually buy the argument, and children is just another example of it. And, and now we can all get to an agreement here because we've seen the argument go both ways. I'm going to show you how this works in a minute because we're running out of time. Um, capacity is, is a extraordinarily relevant issue here, okay? Adults surely do have a right to make their own decisions. Isaiah, your intuition is not an unreasonable intuition, but it's not an absolute statement either, because even Isaiah will admit that there are times when it is appropriate to restrict the choices of patients. What we need to figure out is what those conditions look like. I've got something here. Um, you have to look at, okay, in the child example, okay, obviously the, the child's decision was affected by their age. So we have to look at, okay, does the schizophrenia cause this patient to make his decision? You know, he can have some other mental disability where that isn't affecting his decision. It's completely Absolutely. unrelated to his decision. Absolutely. Look. The point is not, and this is to Jeffrey's credit, okay? It would be wrong to say anyone who is diagnosed with the mental illness thereby loses their rights to make their own decisions. That would be absolutely incorrect. It would be a far overreach of the principle. The principle here is not that if you carry a certain diagnosis, then you automatically lose your rights to make decisions. It is exactly as you say, if your decision is secondary to diminished capacity, then that, then that is a reason for us to think that you are not capable of taking responsibility for your decision. In fact, for all of you who wanna argue, we have to respect the autonomy of the individual. And, and I'm running out of time and I wanna to get to a couple more slides. Um, be very careful here. Distinguish between liberty and autonomy. Liberty is a negative right. It is a right of non-interference. It's actually a pretty weak right. It still could be really important. Okay, but it just means free of restraint. It just means that no one's holding you down. Autonomy is a far richer notion. It is a positive right. It is a stronger claim because when you are autonomous, comes from the Latin, auto, which is the reflexive, points back on you, nomos, law. When you are autonomous, you are a self law. It's not just nobody's restricting my freedom, it's more than that. It's I'm deciding for myself based on my values, what I want out of life. And I am orchestrating my decisions in order to attain those goals. It is a self-direction. The reason children need guardians is because they don't have that yet. They haven't reached the maturity of thinking of being able to put off short-term gain for long-term value. But the same could be true with someone who suffers from a mental illness or intellectual disabilities or, or who is delirious under a physical illness or unconscious. So autonomous, autonomy requires the ability to make intentional choices that advance your values. Alora, I'm gonna tell you this, the religion issue is not a different issue. It's not because it's religion. Religion doesn't give you some special pass. There, are, there can be really stupid religious beliefs, really dangerous ones that we should squelch. So just because you put the name religion on it doesn't mean anything. What mattered in the Jehovah's Witness case was 
that it was their authentically held religion, that it was their values, that, that they were orchestrating their lives around a set of principles that mattered to them. It was their autonomous choice of the religion that mattered, not the particular religion that they chose, which is why we should respect people's choice of religion or non-religion as long as that is their choice which is why the Supreme Court of the United States says the child shall not be martyred for the faith of the parents. So if I'm a Jehovah's Witness and I don't want blood transfusions, I get to refuse them. But if my child was in the same car accident, if my six-year-old was in the same car accident, and I say to the doctor, do not transfuse my six-year-old, you know what's gonna happen? We're gonna get a court order to trans transfuse the six-year-old because we're gonna say that child has an interest in reaching the maturity of age where that child can then decide whether or not she wants a blood transfusion for herself. I don't get to do that for her. And I think and what also I, like what? in the um, Jehovah's Witness uh, situation, it's also that he realized the consequences and exactly. he said, I, I realize that I will die if I don't get this, but I am also of the belief that I, this will keep me from some after after persecution or- Which I don't have to agree with, right? I don't have to believe that your religious view is true in order to respect the fact exactly, Lily, as you say, that I do recognize that whether I agree with the content of your choice or not, it is an autonomous choice in the deep sense of autonomy, that you are making an intentional values-based decision, not secondary to mental illness, not secondary to diminished capacity, but actually your own choice. Now, Please, I, I've got to, it would be awful if we don't get to this. I need to explain to you how argument works. And I wish I had another hour because there's actually a process here and we've, and we've had to rush through it. But well, here's what well, I'm, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to stop you, Dr. Gillette, to say, you know, that, that wish you have. I'm someone who likes to help people. If they have a wish that, uh, that we might fulfill in a reasonable way that wouldn't inflict harm on them or on others, then I like to try and meet that wish. And there are other Wednesdays, second semester. Now, I'm not going to pin you down because I think that would be wrong to do as we are recording this session and we will be on <laughs> YouTube. Um, but, but I just want to let you know that there may be a way for that wish to be granted. And I think the students uh, would appreciate it. Some of them had raised their hand electronically. You have gotten them so fired up and so excited about learning how to make uh, a rational argument. And I think it's fabulous. It is 824. Um, okay. All right. I, I know they want to see the slides that you have remaining. And so I think um, we may do a little arm twisting related to your schedule. I know it's your highly. No, no. I'm sure there are some Wednesdays that are available. So here's, here's what we'll do. Okay. Here's what we're going to do. Today was nothing but getting you riled up. And you should not believe anything I say unless I can prove it to you, okay? So, so today was just, wow, there's more to argument than merely expressing your opinion. You actually need to back it up. And what you've begin, you're beginning to see the kernel of is that I can use analogies, I can use examples that draw on intuitions that you already have in order to try to demonstrate to you that the statement you made is actually inconsistent with what you actually believe. And that's the very, very beginning of argument. So what I will do in part two, and I will make this promise, we'll find a Wednesday morning, is that part two will be, all right, we don't have to start by arguing about a case, although we'll review it slightly, but now how do you actually do it? Like, how do you get good at arguing? What does the structure look like? Because this, I'm telling you, is like learning how to do calculus. There's actually a structure and you need to learn the structure of a problem before you can actually attack it. So I will come back another Wednesday and we will talk about process. So I will do that and I will let you go now. I will mute myself now, say thank you all for being here and let your leaders take you out. Wow. Thank Dr. you so Gillette. much. Thank you. Fantastic. 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 Thank you. Thank you, so you for much. doing this. Thank you. Dude. We appreciate you so good Thank for the you. students. I'm so excited that we were able to uh, get you to agree. Uh, and it is recorded that you will come back another Wednesday. Um, and I have Mrs. my list Shaman, of dates. <laughs> fantastic. Mrs. Shamit, any, any last words before we let the students go to the next class? Um, I would just say, wow, great session, guys. Thank you for being brave and unmuting. And, and I know everyone didn't get to speak who wanted to, but fantastic. Um, reflect upon this session. 
Okay, take some time to think about it and write down some thoughts about how how you feel about this. And we will have part two coming probably not till March or April, but that gives you time to think about arguments. And anytime you're in one of these sessions, students, last thought, I was taking notes. I wasn't looking down um, using my phone, but I was writing things down like secondary to delusions and substituted consent and diminished capacity because there are a lot of uh, terms, there's a lot of vocabulary here that you can pick up on and then you can use back to the speaker to make a separate case. So taking notes is not a bad thing, it's a good thing as long as it doesn't take away from your engagement in the discussion that's currently happening. So great job, everybody. Thank you all so much uh, and have a great day. Thank you, Dr. Gillette.